Welcome to Revival Cycles Tech Talk. I'm Stefan, and in this episode, we're going to solve one of life's great mysteries, how to plan out and lay out all the wiring on your motorcycle. All right, so you're looking at rewiring your entire motorcycle, and if you're like most people, that should be really intimidating and quite a daunting process uh, when you first start out. There's a lot that goes into it. You probably look at the OEM wire diagram and within about five minutes you probably have a headache and just most people really, this is the last thing they want to deal with. But if you break it down into smaller pieces, bite-sized chunks, and just focus on one thing at a time, it's really not that bad. And we're going to show you exactly how to do that. And this is the process that we actually use here at Revival Cycles in order to build these bikes. And it all starts out with a checklist. Um, the checklist ensures that we have all the answers to which components are going to be on the bike, which features and functions the bike's going to have, and that really dictates how the rest of the electrical system goes together. Now, on that checklist, the first thing is the M unit. And we've done a lot of videos on these. You've probably seen them. If you're watching this, you probably know exactly what it is. Reference the other videos for the details on this magic device. But this is the heart and soul. This is the brains of the operation. First thing you need to make sure you've got on, uh, on your list. Next, you're going to need a battery. Uh, this is an anti-gravity four cell, which is what we usually use for demonstrations because it's nice, light, small, and uh, it does the job. But in most builds, if you've got an electric starter, you're going to need at least an eight cell battery. If you've got a larger displacement bike, basically anything over, I don't know, about 800 to 1000 cc's, you should probably step up to a 12 cell. And if you've got some absolute monster, high compression, enormous displacement, then push up to a 16 cell. Um, also going to need a starter solenoid. We've done a nice little video on this unit, which is the recommended starter solenoid because it's got a built-in main fuse and it's just very simple um, and concise package makes installation very simple. So starter solenoid, good thing to have. Uh, you're also going to need some handlebar switches. In this case, I would recommend the M-Switch Minis. These are really convenient because they come pre-wired with a multi-conductor wire. We've done a video on these as well. These are great, and this is what I prefer to use on all of our builds. You're also going to need some kind of an instrument or dash panel, some warning lights, a speedometer, maybe a tachometer. And you can use the OEM stuff, but uh, you might also want to use this Motoscope Mini from MotoGadget because it's really compact and it's just a simple little solution. Um, we'll show you basically the general gist. We're going to leave the instrument as kind of just a black box of these are the inputs that need to go to it, and then the details of what's happening on the instrument panel are going to be up to your specific bike. Um, there's a few more things that we're going to need, and just so I don't forget, I'm actually going to reference our checklist. So we've talked about the M unit battery ignition system. Uh, we'll demonstrate based off an OEM ignition system in this case, and that is basically the reason we do that is because any aftermarket system will tell you how to adjust or how to convert from the OEM system to the aftermarket system. So we'll start OEM. You can make the conversion based on your specific system. Uh, charging system, again, those usually stay fairly close to the OEM format. The one thing that is a difference or a discrepancy is we recommend upgrading the regulator rectifiers to modern solid state units if you've got one of the old um, separate regulator and separate rectifiers. The combination reg rec is just a simpler way to go, easier to wire, and just generally more reliable. Um, we talked about a starter solenoid. We're also going to need a horn. You're going to need an ignition switch, something to turn the whole thing on and off. Uh, just because it's the more interesting version, we'll use an M-lock in this demonstration. Um, we talked about handlebar switches, gauge and dash light, uh, brake light switches. Typically, those are going to be part of the um, perch or part of the levers. Uh, if you don't have them on your levers and you're using hydraulic brakes, just use the hydraulic brake switches for the banjo bolts. Um, also need engine sensors, neutral, um, oil pressure, uh, vehicle speed sensor, and a few others that you may have added in order to communicate all the lights on the dash. So make sure you've got all your sensors laid out. Maybe you need low fuel light sensors and things like that. You'll need to get that included on your wire diagram. Uh, and then you get down to like just the really basic stuff that every bike has, headlight, taillight, turn signals, and in some cases you'll also need a license plate light depending on your local regulations. That's the checklist for all the components, and once you've got an answer for what those are going to be and which parts and pieces you're going to need, that will determine what outputs, what inputs, and all the details of what goes on your wire diagram. When you actually go to wire the bike, there's a few more things on the checklist. Uh, you're going to need battery cables. Uh, we've got a kit for that. You're going to need uh, wire in various sizes. We've also got a kit for that. 
And then there's a few tools that are really handy to have. Open barrel U crimpers, uh, ferrule crimpers to make the connections to the M unit. Uh, some heat shrink is really handy just for making all the splices that need to happen. And then of course, once you're all done with the wiring, then you need to make a loom. Uh, electrical tape is definitely the easiest and quite common. Uh, if you do want, you can use the braided looms or the tubular looms, but be, be warned that makes the whole process much more difficult and you really are playing this chess game that needs to be three or four moves out so that you don't end up with a termination where you can't get loom on it. Start, if this is your first one, start with just planning electrical tape. After you get used to it, then you can step up to doing uh, tubular loom. It's way more difficult. All right, so now that we've got our checklist determined, we can actually start laying out what we're going to do and how we're going to do it. So we've got a little bit bigger whiteboard this time and we're going to need that because this will get kind of complicated. I'll do my best to keep it clean and concise, uh, but again, doing this on the fly, I'm liable to make mistakes, so please bear with me. First thing, uh, M unit. So we'll start with making an M unit right in the middle. And of course these proportions aren't accurate, but it's more so that we can tell what this thing is. Now we've got all the outputs. We start with a right turn, then we've got the starter, horn, left turn, uh, then we've got the low beam, high beam, the brake light, and the auxiliary. Then down here we've got the main power input. The two mounting bosses are ground, and just so we don't forget, I'm going to ground that right now. Then same thing on inputs, it's right turn, starter, horn, left turn, then it's config, then it's headlight, then brake, and then lock input. All right, so there's the M unit. Um, next up will be, next up will be the battery. And I'm gonna put that over here in this corner. We got a positive and a negative. Uh, next, ignition system. So we'll start with just drawing a couple of coils. The wire diagram that I'm drawing right now is actually based off of a Honda CB350, uh, partly because it's a very common bike that we get a lot of questions about. And it's also a good example because it is kind of just a very basic wiring diagram for virtually any motorcycle. Almost all the Japanese bikes will have the same kind of uh, wiring scheme. I'm actually going to move those, they're a little too high. So let's start those guys over. Ignition system coils. All right, and those have spark plug wires that go out to spark plugs that don't look anything like this, but I think you know what I mean. Another spark plug. All right. We also have a contact breaker plate, and that's where your points are. But don't worry about wiring that stuff up yet. Just call that an ignition system. Also going to need a charging system, and for that I'm going to start with the stator. And in the case of the Honda CB350, it looks kind of like this, at least according to the manual. And these are the, uh, the actual stator windings, uh, the different coils. And the CB350 is a little bit weird because it's got this old archaic format where they will um, they basically connect one coil when you're using the lights and disconnect it when you're not using the lights. But with modern regulator rectifiers, there's no need to do this anymore. And so we'll actually just join. These wires are the yellow, white, and then the pink is over here. And what we'll do is just join the white wire to the pink, or sorry, white wire to the yellow. And that simulates what happens in the switch when you turn the headlights on. Okay, so we've got our stator. The other part of a charging system is just the regulator rectifier. And we're going to assume a combination reg rec. That'll take care of our charging system. Um, after that, we need a starter solenoid. So I'm going to put that right here. And like I said, our starter solenoid comes with a main fuse in it, and that's going to happen in this little control box. And then here's schematically, this is the actual solenoid down here for the high current to the starter, which we need a starter right here. And 
it's got a little thing that sticks out there and the part to connect the electric. Of course, the starter is grounded through the chassis of the bike, so add that in real quick. Uh, after that, we need a horn. Easy enough, just throw a horn up here, and it makes noise. Ignition switch. Like I said, we'll use an M-lock in this demonstration. All right. Handlebar switches. We're going to put those over here. Because we're demonstrating this with the M-Switch Minis, these have three different buttons, three different circuits built into them, and those are just momentary contacts, and they look kind of something like this. So this can be the left, and this one can be the right. All right, handlebar switch is done. So next up, we've got the um, dash and instrument panel. And like I said, we're just going to represent this with a single kind of schematic gauge. Uh, it's got, you know, round face and a needle that points somewhere near red line. Um, for the electrical connections, it's just going to be kind of, everything's going to connect to this one uh, line. And that, just realize that this whole thing, that's your dash entirely. If you're using the OEM dash, reference your OEM diagram to figure out how they should connect within there. Uh, if you're using an aftermarket, use their instructions. If you're using Moto Gadget, use their instructions. But everything that feeds into the dash, the, the inputs for the dash, are all just going to connect to that one node. All right, uh, after the dash, uh, we need some brake light switches. So of course, these are going to be mounted at the um, levers or on the hydraulic lines, but I'm just going to schematically represent them down here because it's convenient for my drawing. So these are also going to be ground reference switches, so we'll just add a ground. This will be the rear, and this will be the front. Next, we've got engine sensors. So we've got a neutral, an oil pressure, and a vehicle speed sensor. Now, these again are all just simple switches that reference to ground. And both the neutral light and oil pressure light will ground through the engine, whereas the vehicle speed sensor is the magnetic reed switch that comes with a Moto Gadget gauge, and that you can ground either through the wire or to the chassis, whatever's convenient, just make sure it's a good solid contact ground. After engine sensors, let's put in a headlight. Um, so just a simple headlight with a shell. And of course we need a tail light, so simple tail light. Then we also need some turn signals. So we've got a right, a left, and a right and left. Uh, last thing, that license plate light. I'll just throw that in over here as an example of what else you might need. So turn signals and brake lights all make light. And those weird squiggly lines, that's, that's what light looks like in the electrical world. Okay, that is all the components that we need to have in our system. And the only thing that remains at this point is to connect them all up. Uh, remember, with the starter solenoid, we do have a main fuse, so that comes off of this lug, and then there's the fuse up here, and then it's got two outputs from that fuse. Just so we don't forget, I'll call, we'll call this the fuse. All right, so when I'm wiring a bike, the first thing I want to do is connect the, the big heavy cables for the battery. They're the most difficult to route because they're the largest, the stiffest, and it's also just a good spot to start because it's really simple. You can get your head around it and that gets your feet wet, just gets your mind in the game. So big heavy cable goes from the starter solenoid right to the battery post and then from the solenoid right to the starter. Now this gives us a connection through the main fuse to these two terminals and that's what we'll use to actually power the auxiliary. Now I'm going to switch to a little bit smaller wire and we'll make that connection. Now keep in mind that main fuse is there. So we've already got the main fuse in the system. No problem. That means we can also connect directly to, from that other terminal, directly to the regulator rectifier. 
And we also can connect constant power to the M lock right down here. But remember, the M lock needs to have a one amp fuse to protect those small wires that are in there. So this is just a little fuse. Yeah. Writing on a whiteboard is not my specialty, but I hope you know what that means. The other thing that needs constant power uh, potentially is your gauge. If it's got a, a time of day clock or something like that, you're going to need to have power run up there. And in the case of Moto Gadget gauges, that power also needs to be fused at one amp. So you can piggyback right off the one that's powering the M lock, and we can just bring that up and feed it into our instrument cluster. That's pretty much everything that needs to have constant power in the system or a continuous connection to the battery. So next up, uh, I'd like to do the inputs just because it's pretty straightforward. Uh, the first thing that we'll do is connect the right hand turn signal. The assignment of buttons on your handlebar controls aren't important, but in our case, let's just do that one's going to be the right hand turn signal. Next, we'll do the starter. Starter comes in. After that, we've got the horn. And with the horn, I know I'm going to run out of color. So the horn's going to get a red with black dash. Add that dash in. All right. Now we've got the left-hand turn signal, and that one will be purple. And I made these kind of close, but I think I can sneak everything through. Now the next one up is the config, and there's no need to have a continuous configuration connection connection, because most of the time you'll configure the M unit once and then that's it. If you are using an M button, of course the M button connects to config, and then all this stuff shifts back to the bars, but you still have pretty much all the same connections. All right, um, the, the next one's headlight, so that one will be blue. Sneak that through, goes to headlight. Uh, lastly, we've got the brake. How about, brake can be pink. And that's just gonna connect right down to our front and also rear brake light switches. Okay, last input is the lock input, and that is just going to go directly down to the M lock. And the last thing the M lock needs is a ground, so we can throw that in. Sometimes you actually want to carry the grounds all to a common um, splice connection so that you don't have to wonder if you've got a good connection to your chassis ground. And I'll show that on a few of the other uh, components here, but because it gets too complicated, a lot of the things down here, I'm just going to leave them with the typical ground signal. But realize you could actually run wires to each of these components and ensure that you've got excellent ground connections. And of course, all of our handlebar switches need to have that ground. And I'm going to bring that up all the way to here. And this is an example I was just explaining where all of the grounds splice together and go to a common termination to make sure that you've got excellent ground connections. Good, inputs are done. At this point, if you were actually wiring the bike and you'd actually done all of these things, you could turn the M unit on and actually verify that all of your inputs work because when you connect these, the LEDs on the M unit will light up as will the outputs and you can make sure that you don't have any mistakes at this point. The next thing that I would do um, if I were wiring a bike, and in this case planning the wiring of a bike, I would um, actually work on the ignition and the charging systems. So the charging system is almost complete because the regulator rectifier just needs a connection to the stator and also a connection to ground. So we add our ground right here. And then typically your stator wires or at least the wires on your regulator rectifier are going to be yellow. I don't have a yellow pen because you wouldn't be able to see it. And in that case, we're going to use orange. 
So from those two, those go into the regulator rectifier. OK, uh, if you were able to actually start and run this bike in this condition, it would actually charge the battery. This whole setup is actually working as a complete charging system, at least in terms of the CB350, because they're very simple and there's nothing else that goes to it. Some of you guys with the BMW R bikes or the uh, Moto Guzzi's that have field excited ignition, or excuse me, field excited charging systems, it'll get a little more complicated, but we'll review that at the end of this discussion. Next up, ignition system. Now, the ignition system gets powered from the auxiliary output, and on our bikes, I like to use brown as the switched power wire, and that one just kind of comes up and splits and powers both the coils. This is part of what makes breaker points ignitions really simple and reliable, is that there's just not, not that much to them. The only other thing we need to get the ignition system to work is a connection from each coil to the breaker points. And for lack of a better color, we'll just say that this one is pink. All right. And of course, the breaker points are grounded through the engine. Now, that's enough to get a, a OEM breaker points type ignition to actually work on the bike. Um, if you were installing an aftermarket ignition system, consider from this reference as the OEM reference, whatever modifications they ask for in their system, just apply those to this portion of the diagram, realizing you get power for the entire ignition system from the auxiliary output. Okay, the next um, output that we can work on is the brake. And for our brake, we're using pink. And the brake is very, very easy. It just needs to go off and go to our tail light. If your taillights like most taillights, you're going to have three wires. You're going to have the ground, uh, the pink brake light, and then you're also going to have a tail light, which I'm going to draw as purple. But because we're using an M unit, you can just tie those together. So take your purple tail light wire and tie it in with your pink brake light wire, and then configure the M unit for one wire tail light, and tail light's done. So next after that, high beam. That one, I always like to use blue. And we can take off from there, go across to the headlight. We're also going to need to connect our high beam to the instrument lights so that you know you've got your high beam indicator on your dash. That ties in there. Also going to need a low beam. Don't really have a great color for low beam, but let's just use green and we'll throw some dashes on it. So that's going to go along to the headlight. And some black dashes just to differentiate it from the starter wire when we get to it. OK, so now we've got everything up to the turn signals worked out and our turn signal is purple and that's for the left hand turn signal so that just runs out to the left hand turn signal again it also needs to connect to our instruments so that you know when your turn signals are operating so we're going to splice off of that and go up to our instrument the horn is red with black fleck. So the horn just goes out and up to the horn. And then add our little black dots so we know that it's not a constant power wire, which are all red. Then the starter, pretty simple. That one's green. And it's just going to go down to the starter solenoid. Starter solenoid also needs to have a ground connection, and we can just bring that out and ground it. Now, these two terminals, what they're really doing, they're going inside, they go to the control coil, and that's what actually activates the solenoid in order to turn the starter on. Last one is the right hand turn signal, 
And that one, as you would expect, just goes straight out to the right-hand turn signal. Of course, we also need to have that connection to the, to the instrument panel. So those go up, cruise across, and go to the instrument panel. All right, getting close. We've got a charging system, ignition system. We need some grounds on our lighting. Um, we also, we didn't even connect our forward turn signals, so we can just splice off of this guy right here, come down, feed that one, and purple for the other. Splice off right here, come down, and feed the left. Need some grounds to finish off our lighting circuits. So, bring that all together. And you know what? We can just tie that into this ground right here. That's fine. Same thing over here. We've got a few that just need to tie in so that they're grounded. May as well ground our license plate light. And now that it's grounded, let's connect it. The license plate light should be on anytime you're riding the bike, so we'll just connect that to the auxiliary power. And right there, now we've got a license plate light. What isn't connected? All right, all of our engine uh, sensors are still not connected, but that's pretty much it. And in the case of these engine sensors, they just go directly to the gauge. So we can bring this VSS, which is vehicle speed sensor, straight up and into the gauge. Then the oil, the oil pressure sensor can, that one can be pink because we don't have that going into the gauge yet. That goes into the gauge. And the last one, the neutral light, also just goes up and into the gauge. So we just worked out an entire wiring diagram for a basic Honda CB, virtually any CB, but also virtually any Japanese bike. There's one last thing that uh, if anyone's really paying close attention, you'd notice we don't have a ground on our battery. Naturally, you need that. This needs to go uh, to the chassis, to the engine, and, and to the M unit, and that will also tie in to all of this forward lighting and this back lighting, et cetera. So this is pretty appropriate to most of the uh, Japanese and maybe Italian bikes from before 1980 or so. This is pretty close to what you'd be looking at. However, if you've got a field excited charging system, there's a bit of a change that needs to happen over here with our stator and regulator rectifier. First of all, uh, field excited charging systems are three phase. So we don't have this type of arrangement. We just have three yellow wires that go to the regulator rectifier and those represent the three phases. Uh, but then we also have two other connections that come out to power what is known as the field coil. And those wires might be different colors depending on exactly which type of bike you've got. And what the field coil does is it creates a magnetic field that the, um, it creates a magnetic field that actually rotates inside the stator, and that is what induces the current in the stator windings, creating the power. The regulator rectifier then rectifies it into DC, sends it back to the battery through the solenoid. Um, the last thing that we need in order to get a field excited system to work is we do need a connection to the auxiliary because it needs a reference or excitation voltage to begin creating that power because it, gotta, it needs to have something in order to power the field coil before the stator can actually generate power. So that would be what's there. All the wire colors on this are going to be a little different depending on specifically which rectifier you're using or specifically which bike this is on. Also, if you are working on a Harley or a uh, BMW or a Moto Guzzi, your starter system is slightly different than this. and you will still have a starter solenoid, except it is integrated directly into the starter itself. And what that means is, I'm gonna erase this section and show you how it would be connected if you had a BMW, Harley, or Moto Guzzi. So, we get rid of the solenoid there, 
and recall that it's actually integral to the starter itself. So the starter now just connects directly to the battery. And then there is a starter control wire that comes down and plugs into the starter somewhere. Sometimes it's a little tab on the back, but it's a small quarter inch spade connection and that controls the integrated solenoid in the starter. And now your starter actually works. Notice we've got some dangling wires here. That's not gonna do. We need to add in a main fuse again. So these guys can be connected and then add our main fuse and then tie that back in to our battery. So now this works for any of the Harley BMW Moto Guzzi. Also has the field excited uh, charging system. And again, use your auxiliary output to power the ignition system, but the details of your ignition system are going to depend on your specific bike and which specific ignition system you plan to use. Really shouldn't be too hard to uh, deduce or work through how to upgrade from this OEM coils and breaker plate to a solid state ignition. Well, I hope that wasn't too confusing. Um, I realize that this is a lot of information. It probably is still daunting. Uh, electrical takes some time to get used to. Uh, we've got a few other videos that we've done uh, that explain kind of the fundamental theories of electricity as applied to motorcycles. And um, here you can see how all of this, the different components, all the different systems work with each other and how they connect to each other. And if you work through this step by step, system by system, one at a time, focus on one circuit at a time, this can be your map, your roadmap to get through your whole project. This is a great place to start. It doesn't cost you any money to work out this part and you can figure out and get your head wrapped around the entire electrical project before you even spend a dollar. At Revival Cycles, we always use the parts that we sell. Then that means that we know exactly how they work. We know exactly how they don't work. And that means if you run into trouble on your build, you can always send an email to tech support at revivalcycles.com. Speaking of making mistakes and running into trouble, I realized there's one thing on this diagram that I forgot, and that is we need to have a switched power connection to our instrument cluster so you can turn on things like your, uh, your indicator lights, so just the dash lights to light up at night so you can see your gauges at night, um, or just to turn the gauge on completely. So for that, we're just gonna tie off of the auxiliary and sneak up here. This one also needs to have a fuse, and then it can find a spot into the instrument harness. Remember to mark that as fuse. All right, like I said, knew I was gonna make a mistake somewhere along the line today, and nobody's perfect. The trick is when you do make a mistake, you go back and fix it. So on that, I really do thank you for watching, and if you are interested in these parts, check out revivalcycles.com. If you run into troubles, tech support at revivalcycles.com. Now, at the start of this, you probably thought this was gonna be a really difficult and intimidating process. I really do hope that going over at this level has answered a lot of your questions and taken some of the fear out of tackling a project of this scale. Trust me, it's not that bad. Just break it down one system at a time and focus on one circuit in that system at a time and you can get through this. Thanks for watching, guys. Get your bikes back on the road.